Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper. Welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around our world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, in Moana Nui Akea. Today's episode focuses on the UN Pacific Forum on Business and Human Rights, UN Guiding Principles for Positive Governance. Today, I'm fortunate to be joined by an amazing advocate and want to thank you so much for coming and sharing with us about your experience here at the third annual UN Forum on Business and Human Rights in Suva, Fiji. David, thank you for joining. Bola, and thank you through Joshua. It's an honor to be on your show. Uh, the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, OHHR Pacific Regional Office, and the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights host the third annual Forum on Business and Human Rights, bringing together bold participants to discuss the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and enable, protect, respect, and remedy pillars to defend communities regarding corporate activities. This two-day summit raised awareness and builds capacities of stakeholders around business and human rights standards in the Pacific. And the gathering encourages peer learning among states, national human rights institutions, businesses, industry associates, international organizations, trade unions, civil society organizations, and academics in Oceania, facilitating regional exchange of good practices. David, why is the UN Pacific Forum on Business and Human Rights important in our islands? And how does it relate to everyday advocacy and campaigns for social change? Thank you, Joshua. Um, first of all, I am I work for the government in Papua New Guinea. I am the principal advisor for international relations with the National Youth Development Authority. Um, however, I also am a human rights defender. And in my view, the importance of holding uh, importance of having the uh, human rights and business forum and uh, amplifying um, the cause and the stance of human rights in the Pacific um, with all human rights defenders all dedicating their life day to day for a cause. Um, it is important that our capacities need to be built, meaning that we must be informed with um, the regional frameworks, the guiding principles, um, as well as how we could learn from each other um, using different approaches and best practices um, that we can actually learn from. In that way, um, it is a re region within region learning, peer-to-peer um, -peer learning, um, and some of the inter interesting interventions can be replicated in other um, countries um, that have similar contexts can can then um, be workable um, in, in, in that case. Um, another thing is also having this regional um, forum uh, brings together the camaraderie of those who stand up for human rights and sometimes working in isolation and in silos may be one of those biggest challenges because we back in our countries we feel disempowered or maybe alone but when you come together with an army of people who have the same vision and who fight the same cause with you it gives you that fulfillment and motivation to go back and do more and scale up your work That's a great point. Uh, the the solidarity that you could feel in the room. We have representatives from Papua New Guinea. We have representatives here in Fiji. We have representatives from all over Oceania who are engaging on a daily basis to try to combat corruption, counter corporations that are infringing on the free prior informed consent of indigenous peoples throughout the islands in the Pacific. And it's really important to see how, as you said, people could share best practices and then scale those up to be able to make a positive social change in the communities. Maybe you could share with us a bit too on some of the highlights from the two day event in this summit in Suva and why the UN guiding principles is an important instrument for you. Yes, um, one of the key highlights was um, learning from corporations that uphold the um, utilizing the UN guiding principles, especially having a remedy mechanism um, in in their businesses. That is one thing that I've really learned that needs to needs to be advocated uh, when I go back to Papua New Guinea. Um, learning from also the case studies from. Um, 
mining and in the extractive industry of how indigenous people need to come to the table of decision making and also must be informed the real intentions of the um, mining and exploration activities and being informed about the environmental um, destruction that may or in, in, in that cause um, to recover loss and damage. Um, that is one thing um, that I am taking back. Um, secondly is that I've also realized during this forum is that we may come up with um, the guiding principles and all of these regional frameworks, but in order for these to be effective on the ground is domesticating that. Um, and that shows in um, law and legislation reforms that need to take place because in the Pacific, there are many laws that are still colonial laws that need are yet to be reformed. For example, in Papua New Guinea, we have the mining um, legislation which um, the beneficiaries of indigenous people has been 3%. And recently with the current government, what we've changed has now increased to 15%. So that's just a progress, but then how do we translate this law into um, a practical action that can bring out impact? Um, some other learnings that throughout um, the forum, um, not only about the guiding principles, but uh, one of the most important uh, gaps that was that we've also realized is the, um, the gap that exists between governance, uh, governments communicating with the civil society organization. Um, and we shouldn't be seeing the government, especially someone from the government shouldn't be seen civil society as um, a threat, but rather um, a function that holds us accountable so that we can do the right thing for human rights. That's a really good point. And if we look at what's going on, I think the UN Pacific Forum on Business and Human Rights is important in our islands. And it also connects too with the UN 2030 agenda and the Paris Agreement. Can you share how those three, as you talked about earlier, we break down silos and can bring them all together? to then be able to have a comprehensive campaign that guarantees human rights, that guarantees sustainable development, but also climate justice for all in Oceania. Yes, it's, it's about bringing all um, protagonist actors to the table um, and also important to be informed, well informed by um, research development on the ground because these bigger goals that we are working towards, such mm -hmm. as the Paris Agreement, the um, uh, the um, 2030 agenda, UN 2030 agenda. Um, these are just roadmaps that we are looking to, towards, but then needs to be practical. Um, way of measuring um, how we are progressing. And this is not only measured through experiences, but rather figures, numbers, and scientific um, uh, evidences. Um, and at the regional level, I think we should um, start to um, increase investments into reporting as well, um, because like I said, that data statistics and analysis um, seems to be one of those um, uh, bigger um, uh, components that that's missing in our reporting, um, even though there are some real challenges being faced on the ground, but there is nothing there to back it up. So um, in, in that, uh, what I, I'm trying to say is that we need evidence-based um, progress in our dialogues and there needs to be collaboration and communication between the protagonist actors which includes the human rights defenders civil society organizations communities indigenous businesses corporates investors and governments it's a really good point because it really will take all of us to be able to survive the current climate crisis but as you said all stakeholders must be included and also citizen scientists, citizens can contribute. And that idea you mentioned of data in a dashboard as well as disaggregated data is absolutely essential as we go forward to implement these UN guiding principles. Maybe you could share a bit too about why the guiding principles are so important in Papua New Guinea and how you utilize this UN language to then make a difference 
with some of the challenges that are facing your country? Yes, Joshua. Um, interestingly, yesterday we had Papua New Guinea pop up in many of the sessions and used as an example. And I guess that is not only a challenge, but it is also for us to um, see what we are doing right and not doing properly. And I guess the language of um, the UN and the human rights need, needs to be simplified. Um, to the context of our people to understand um, their own rights as indigenous peoples, how they engage in businesses, how, that they also have a right to remedy, uh, how to report, um, learn about the reporting processes, and also how can they hold businesses and governments accountable. That is very important. So what we've done so far in Papua New Guinea um, since we were the state under review under the UPR um, process, which was last year, uh, what we've done with the UNFPA, United Nations Population Fund in Papua New Guinea, um, in collaboration with the National Youth Development Authority was to disseminate the information on UN processes and reporting processes and the guidelines um, in uh, to young people through the mock youth parliament. So last year we saw 75 young people who were brought together from all provinces of Papua New Guinea to learn about this, um, not only using the UN language, but how do we simplify that in their own context so that they can understand, because we're talking about young people um, in the next, by 2030, they are the ones who will take ownership and will be affected with the decisions that we are making as leaders today and policy makers today. And we've also recently done that this year with another 60 young people. So that's what progress looks like, but there needs to be more to be, uh, there, there is a need for more to be done, um, not only within the youth space, but within the communities, because one thing that we've also realized that um, the illiteracy rates in Papua New Guinea can be one of the contributing factors of trying to break through this um, issue of getting it right. It's excellent that you brought up the Universal Periodic Review because the UPR is a process that engages all stakeholders across the entire nation. And more importantly, also it happens every four and a half years. So it's great to hear about the follow-up you're doing to show how the Universal Periodic Review is connected to this process too as well with the UN working group that exists on business and human rights with representatives from Asia Pacific region and all of the other four. But also, as you pointed out, the sustainable development goals and how those are important with the voluntary national review. And most recently, building on the success of COP with Egypt just closing down the nationally determined contribution. So it's important, as you say, everyone's society across the whole state of Papua New Guinea must come together, but also utilize all of the UN processes to really leverage what is important to guarantee the liberation of your people from colonial constructs that still persist, but all the way up to the present challenges that everyone's facing on a heating planet. So what we're looking at next is maybe you could share some highlights from the two-day summit in Suva and some of the panels. What were some of the best speakers and some of the observations you have from those panels that looked at Remedy, that featured representatives from many UN agencies, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and many of those that operate daily in Oceania? Yes, um, I think the panel on UN guiding principles was one of the major highlights because um, it was interesting to learn from the room that nobody actually knew what the UN guiding principles were. Um, and, and for me, as someone who only have heard about the UN guiding principles now and read only some of the documents, but not really um unpack what the UN guiding principles were. And I think um in in, in the um in, in that panel um learning about the human rights um due diligence um processes also the impact assessments of human rights um must be done in consultation also um the access to remedy was 
I, I would say was the language that was spoken that popped up o- over the two days, access to remedy and um, coming to realize that in many of the countries in the Pacific, we, we don't have that, that mechanism um, in order to hold businesses accountable. One of the best practices that I've learned from is ANZ, the model that you, they use in the statement um, of how they carry out their businesses, um, where they had a, um, access to remedy framework, where cu- customers had a complaint. There was a portal um, created for them in order for the uh, management to address such issues. Um, However, um, on the flip side of it, sometimes we think that we are doing the right and just putting a mechanism up there, but it cannot maybe effective because the follow-up and follow-through processes can uh, either determine uh, one or two things. Maybe it's just only a letter of apology. Maybe it can be a compensation, which may not be enough. But however, these little actions do matter. The small things build to bigger things. So once we set that standard in different businesses um, and um, areas of concern, it does push that envelope to implement the guiding principles. I think another interesting one, because Papua New Guinea is heavily involved in the uh, mining and extractive industry, was learning from um, the panel on, uh, I think, the second last panel. Sorry, I'm just going through my notes on on that. Oh, yeah, the responsible business conduct in the extractive and mineral sectors with, I think, Karen Adams from the Human Rights Law Center talked about Papua New Guinea. That's right. And learning from um, Dome, uh, which is a, an Australian um, company, mining company, that the approaches that it's now taken, which is more consultative with indigenous people um, before, after getting its um, license to explore, um, what, what are the practical steps that it took, ensuring that this is um, the process that they had Um, before the mining exploration takes place, they're also considering the benefits um, of indigenous people, creating opportunities for indigenous people, um, such as infrastructure improvement, um, opportunities to employment, but also considering um, what the indigenous people want. And that's one thing that uh, really, What's the highlight for me? Because when I go back again in Papua New Guinea, I feel like there needs to be uh, more that needs to be done um, in terms of creating awareness to our local people that before a mining company comes into the country, people must know and understand the real intention of this and how it um, contributes to um, the first and foremost, the integral development of our people before um, shifting profits to governments and um, to the economy of the country. <laughs> the people-centered approach really was prevalent throughout the many panels, and it was exciting to see the UN Human Rights Council special procedures, the working group members, but also yeah. the rapporteurs sharing how they've utilized those instruments to then uphold UN standards at the local level. And building on that, maybe you could share what follow-up for fundamental freedoms and human rights will you include from this third overall Pacific Forum on Business and Human Rights as you return? And what are some priorities? I know we discussed maybe looking at filing some individual complaints, but also reaching out for actions from these important international institutions, such as rapporteurs and working groups. Yes. Um, so one thing that we realized as government officials in this forum was to go back again and utilize the 16 days of um, activism, human rights activism in the country to um, amplify um, what was learned from the um, forum. But the practical actions that we're going to take forward is to um, bring together civil society through the CIMC, Consultative Implementation Monitoring Council, um, to run a full, uh, maybe a week of quarterly workshops for civil society organizations um, to understand the processes and also the mechanisms of the UN, such as the working group, the special rapporteurs, and um, how the civil society 
can go on the ground to assist communities um, to do submissions. Um, because where the uh, arms of government fall short, it's the civil society and the community-based organizations that go on the ground um, to um, bring in services and um, empowerment programs to um, community development programs uh, in communities. So that is the best way that we are looking at it because if the government interve intervenes into um, uh, trying to push for um, submissions on the ground, it may be um, a challenge um, to to the government as government officials taking the lead, but rather um, strategically um, give more power to the civil society so that in that way we're also making aware to the government that the, the role of civil society is important so that they hold us accountable. That's a great point. It reminds me too of the panel that was the UN Guiding Principles 10 plus because it's only been around a decade, but they shared about the roadmap for the next decade of business and human rights. Could you share how you think that roadmap might be beneficial in Papua New Guinea as we go forward? Definitely, definitely it can be. And the most important, uh, I think, when they shared the roadmap for um, Papua New Guinea, it, it kind of sets, it kind of, but it really sets the standards of how um, different sectors um, within, within the country, from private sector businesses, civil society, the communities, and um, governments, um, that provides that framework and can work towards um, fulfilling um, what's in the UN guiding principles. Great point. And then that really reminds me of what you were talking about upon returning. So what's exciting we know is on 25 November, it kicks off 16 days of action. And that comes up to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights anniversary. And this year is the 74th anniversary, but the way people are celebrating is kicking off a full year of human rights education leading up to the 75th anniversary. What are some of the things that are gonna happen in Papua New Guinea that you can share with us? Yes, um, interestingly in Papua New Guinea, we don't have the, we don't celebrate 16 days only. We have 21 days of human rights activism. Um, <laughs> so that's interesting because um, that's how the civil society decided to bring in more, um, uh, advocacy and more period, you know, time in the activism period. So while we are in Fiji, there is always already a launching done in Anga, um, Anga province in Wapenamanda, and they've kicked off the Human Rights Film Festival um, and other awareness programs that's already happening in, up in the highlands. There will also be a film festival um, in certain parts of the country, um, in different cities. Uh, and there are other fun days and walk for life um, activities that are happening in the National Capital District, which is headed by the um, active cities in Port Mosby. Um, and this engages more young people, civil society, um, raising awareness, not only um, having a fun day, but also educating the public on human rights. That's excellent. And maybe you can share as well the breadth and depth and the beauty of the culture of Papua New Guinea. How many languages that are spoken and all those different unique perspectives that give an overall vision of what humanity really is. I, I'll never forget some of the quotes walking through the museum where he was saying, welcome to the University of Community. And there's so mm -hmm. much traditional knowledge. Maybe you could share some of that with us on how that then offers a bolder vision for the future we all desire. Yes, I thank you for raising this. Um, Papua New Guinea is more like a the entire world shrinked into one country called Papua New Guinea because we have a population of almost nine million um, now, and we speak more than eight hundred languages with a thousand tribes. Um, and to, it's amazing how Papua New Guinea comes together, which is united by its diversity. And that's mostly driven by a generation that is now waking up to say that we have to now stand together. Um, and the young generation is now taking lead in revisiting our cultural um, practices, unity, and spreading the uh, message, of, message of 
um, uniting through our diversity. Um, what's really also, what really works in Papua New Guinea is that um, after colonization, we have a language called Tokpisin, which is broken English and broken German. So many people wonder how do people who speak 800 and 800 plus languages from over a thousand tribes come together. So we have what we call Tokpisin, um, which is called Pidgin. <laughs> so the, Tokpisin is one of the languages that brings together people. And it has, it is an official language, of course, apart from English and Motuan. So um, again, highlighting how can Papua New Guinea move forward in the 2030 agenda? If the world can come together in forming the sustainable development goals, it's the similar concept. However, what really brings together at the core of how we can move together is humanity. It's about seeing the human in people. That's perfect. And as we look forward, we can look at the follow-up to the UPR, but also this roadmap on the UN guiding principles and bringing all those unique visions from the Sepik River all the way down to Port Moresby to share those, as well as many islands that you have as well. How do you reach out and include all the people of Papua New Guinea in the guiding principles discussion that will develop from this third forum on business and human rights, but also on the follow-up of the UPR? Oh, interestingly, um, that's a good question. How do we include all of these people from the highlands to the islands to Momasa and the south end um, to be included in the guiding principles? Um, what we have in, in Papua New Guinea, we have four regions. All of these provinces are clustered in four regions. And I think um, there needs to be an interpretation um, of the UN guiding principles in all four regions, um, bringing together all stakeholders. Um, a similar forum that we have at the regional level, but I think that needs to be um, contextualized at the national level so that people do understand what this big guidelines for these big frameworks and what does that look like in governance and how do the, how does the traditional governance uh, people from traditional governance also participate in this regional and global um, global um, process um, that's the approach that we are tr now planning of taking that is the interpretation in all four regions that's a wonderful way to conclude because we too often forget traditional leadership and how that has actually nurtured and been shaped by the cultures for centuries that then add to the way forward of how we can make sure that the guiding principles, as well as the sustainable development goals and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People can all be forged to guarantee a better life for everyone in Papua New Guinea. Thank you so much for joining us and look forward to continue going forward around the anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and also making sure around Papua New Guinea's continued existence as a United Nations member and a dynamic member of the Melanesian Spearhead Group as well. Thank you, through Joshua. And um, we look forward to um, continuing the conversation back in Papua New Guinea. Mahalo and thank you for joining the third forum on business and human rights and sharing heads and relevancy in Papua New Guinea and around the Pacific. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.